Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali Mastardo, Senior Association Manager with EMA. Thank you for joining us today for EMA's Leadership Development Team's webinar, Do's and Don'ts of Handling and Hauling Asphalt Emulsion. We do have you all on mute for this presentation. Um, if you do have any questions, please use the question feature to submit them. Questions will be answered as time allows. I will now turn it over to Aaron Walker, the Chair of the Leadership Development Team. Aaron? Thanks, Allie. Uh, and welcome everyone to today's session on the do's and don'ts of handling and hauling asphalt emulsion put on by EMA's leadership development team. Uh, as Elliot said, my name is Aaron Walker with Ingevity's Pavement Technologies business and a member of the leadership development team and will be assisting in today's session. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with our group uh, and our goals, our main purpose is to develop future leaders of the association through promotion of the effective use of asphalt emulsions. Um, and in doing so, we're responsible for many initiatives, um, including hosting webinars such as the one today, um, and also hosting a session at the annual general meeting, so stay tuned for more information. Um, but with that being said, I would just like to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dan Schwartz. Uh, Dan is a materials engineer with uh, HG MIGS, a regional asphalt emulsion producer and trucking company in the upper Midwest, a role he's been in for about eight years. Before transitioning to the industry, Dan worked as a research engineer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Modified Asphalt Research Center, where he also earned his master's degree in civil engineering. Dan has been an active member of EMA's leadership development team since its inception in 2017. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan to get us started. All right, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Allie. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're signing in from. As Aaron mentioned, my name is Dan Swartz uh, with Henry G. Miggs. We're a, uh, an upper Midwestern asphalt emulsion terminal. We have three locations in Wisconsin. We're a subsidiary of Asphalt Materials, Inc., who has a footprint all over the upper Midwest. Uh, for today's webinar, we, we really want to focus on the terminaling and hauling aspects of our industry information that we hope manufacturers, producers, even contractors and agencies might find useful. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we jump in. Um, this slide deck was, was really designed to be a reference for your record, something you can walk away with. So some of the slides have some tables and some pretty dense information. We might not spend a lot of time on, on these type of slides, but we just wanted to have that information all in one place so you can, can refer back to it. Uh, secondly, you know, just by nature of the topic being covered, uh, we'll include kind of the obligatory fine print or disclaimer that this information is really based on our experience learned from producing, storing, and hauling in the upper Midwest. Uh, depending on where you are, your customer base, and your product portfolio, your information or your this information might differ. Um, it might even contradict what you find to be true in the industry. But let's jump right into it. Um, so today we're going to cover four topics and really what we want to do is kind of picture day-to-day -day operation or even a full season at a terminal. We've got a picture of our, our main terminal in Portage, Wisconsin here with, with our trucking fleet. Um, we want to look at um, everything after the mill and before application. So production, uh, after production, loading, hauling, and, and some uh, season ending chores. Um, no slide deck about asphalt emulsion really would be complete without a troubleshooting slide. So we've got kind of a common problems and what to do kind of slide at, at the very end here. Um, so let's start right off the bat here with storage and, and we'll slowly kind of walk through the different terminaling operations, move to hauling and then some season ending things. So there are a lot of options um, for storing asphalt em uh, emulsion available to us as producers. So it really kind of helps to knock off the easy variables first uh, to get going with that. So really vertical emulsion tanks are, are the only choice in the terminal locations. Um, they're preferred over horizontal for uh, really a lot of reasons from practical and product quality. From a practical standpoint, tank farm geometry. So getting a lot of tanks in a small footprint, vertical tanks are really your only option. Um, from a quality control standpoint, vertical tanks will minimize surface area. Um, it's easier for mixing. So there are a lot of um, uh, quality uh, advantages as well. Of course, sizing is really dependent on your demand, availability of materials. 
and then how your emulsion plant is set up, whether it's a continuous operation or a batch type facility and what size batches and, and loads you typically have. So how much tank turnover um, you really expect. Um, choosing a tank, you really have, um, the main option is, is materials of construction. I've abbreviated that in the next couple of slides as MOC. Um, asphalt emulsion terminals, particularly, particularly those terminals that produce asphalt emulsion, need to store materials with a wide range of uh, chemical properties and thermal properties. So we need to think of things like corrosivity, um, storage temperature, and structural demands as well. And of course, because we need to be budget con uh, conscious, some sort of life cycle cost. So these are kind of the considerations we have when we are trying to decide on the uh, MOCs for our tanks. Now we're gonna get into e each of these four different types on the next slide in a little bit more detail. Um, but really we have four relevant MOCs for, for emulsion terminals. I've got them listed here, kind of an increase in cost, although you could argue that the FRP bullet point could, could fall anywhere on here, um, just based on all the different adders as the industry calls them, which are basically add-ons to the tank that you buy. So let's take kind of a closer look at each of these four, some pros and cons, um, and then I'll give you an example of, of what our terminal uses each of these four um, on the next slide here. So this is one of those slides that I, that I uh, briefly mentioned in our introduction that's going to have a lot of information on it. Generally not a fan of putting these giant tables in um, slide decks, but again, it'll be something for you as a reference. So let's look at each of the four. We'll list some pros and cons, some advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then based on those advantages and disadvantages, some example materials that we might store hopefully will become a little uh, clearer. So let's start with poly tanks or polymer tanks. Uh, these are generally non-reactive, so they're great for highly corrosive materials. They're relatively inexpensive, easy to move because of their, their uh, dead load, their weight, but they do tend to have limited heating capacity and structural strength. So they're not a real good choice for things that need to be hot, uh, things that um, for very high volumes. We use poly tanks at our terminal um, for concentrated acids like hydrochloric acid, and we do some for light softening oils. So these might be like your bio-based, uh, bio-derived cutting oils and things like that. Um, next on the list, we have uh, carbon steel, and we can carry this similar exercise for the other three uh, MOCs. Carbon steel is kind of the workhorse of most asphalt emulsion terminals. Uh, they're inexpensive. Uh, they take well to aftermarket modification. What I mean by that is, you know, they're easy to weld. They're easy to put uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, ports on them and, and heating and so forth. Um, their corrosion resistant uh, is, is really their disadvantage, right? We know carbon steel will, will corrode um, in the presence of some, some materials and certainly in the presence of air. Um, but they're good choices for molten asphalt, so hot AC. Uh, we use them for finished emulsion tanks. Um, they are good for hydrocarbons and fuels as well, so um, diesel fuel and, and so forth. Next on the list, we have stainless steel. So uh, stainless is more expensive, but what you're getting out of it is corrosion resistance. So we expect operating lives on the order of maybe, um, I don't know, maybe 20 to 50 years for our stainless tanks. Uh, it makes them a good choice. We store raw emulsifier. Um, in our stainless steel tanks. We actually even store our, our um, softened water in stainless steel, and those tanks may last a lifetime. We'll never have to replace them. Um, so mildly corrosion resistant materials, raw, uh, raw emulsifier and the like, do well in stainless steel. They can take temperature pretty well as, uh, as well. I lumped all FRP um, kind of together. Um, even though there's there's really a huge range of polymers and things that you can use. We use a vinyl ester lining in our FRP tanks. Uh, that's really the primary advantage. They're very customizable. Uh, they tend to be expensive. Um, some of them can take some heat. Uh, they're difficult to modify after the fact. Um, we use an, uh, FRP tanks that we expect to last um, well over the lifetime of, of uh, our systems um, for emulsifier soap solution. So we have one for cationic and one for anionic soap. So depending on what your terminal needs are, um, your product portfolio, your customer base and so forth, we're a terminal that does a lot of anionic and cationic emulsions. Um, so we have kind of a wide range of things. You may not need so much, but it helps to go through an exercise like this 
and be honest with yourself on, on replacement costs to figure out what's best for you. Um, I like pictures. We got a lot of pictures in this slide deck. Um, these are from around our terminal. So on the very far left here, these are those finished um, soap solution tanks that I was talking about. These have a vinyl ester um, lining. There's a, a top uh, mixer on this, this tank here. So this is the cold side of our terminal. Uh, this stainless tank is, is a raw emulsifier tank. It has sidewall um, mixers, uh, uninsulated, it's bare. Um, in the middle are, are poly tanks, uh, an uninsulated one on the left and an insulated poly tank on the right. Here's This is where we store our, our uh, highly corrosive pure chemicals. So this uninsulated is our hydrochloric acid for cationic production and our caustic soda or sodium hydroxide is in this insulated poly. This tank is, is lightly heated with an electric heater to keep from crystallization, which is why it's insulated. Um, but that's an example of, of poly tanks. And you can see how portable they are. They're not really attached to anything. Um, this last picture is an uninsulated, so not insulated carbon steel tank. It's, of course, painted to avoid some corrosion. Uh, I chose to include a, a uninsulated picture just because you can see what a carbon steel tank might look like. Um, a few details to note in these pictures. We'll talk about mixers in a little bit, and we'll talk about heating and so forth. But these pictures kind of show, you can see that all of these tanks are sitting on concrete pads. They're not sitting on the earth. In two of the examples, you can see very clearly, how about this stainless one here and this carbon steel one here? These tanks are sitting on raised drainage pads. So this is just like crushed clear stone in a, um, in a collar of steel. Um, really just to keep water away from the base of the tank and to help with a little bit of leveling as well. For larger tanks, that's not really economical, but for these tanks, um, it is, and it help lower our life cycle cost a little bit. Another advantage over um, an aggregate foundation like this is tank leaks do tend to occur on the bottom of the tanks, at least in our experience, and this helps you find a leak a lot faster than, it, um, than if it was just sitting on the earth. So a couple of examples to go with. So in the last slide, we did see a picture of an uninsulated tank, but more or less what you see are insulated tanks, especially for the carbon steel tanks. Here's a big one that you see here. Um, between the aluminum outer shell, which is this gray stuff that you see, and the tank skin, there's somewhere around four inches or so of mineral wool. Uh, mineral wool, as opposed to like a fiberglass or something, um, is very hydrophobic, so it, it kicks out water. It's very fire resistant and it's stiff. So it won't slump under its own weight for these for these large scale applications. In our region, as I mentioned, most tanks are insulated. Um, there's really three reasons for that that I that I can think of anyway. Um, number one, it's generally much cheaper from um, an energy calculation to maintain heat as opposed to constantly ramping temperature as needed. Since we need asphalt to be molten and hot to mill anyway we can take advantage of this heat by just maintaining the temperature post milling. A um, few exceptions, of course, microsurfacing might be one of those. Second though, um, it's really advisable to, min to minimize uh, temperature swings and finished emulsion from a quality standpoint. So um, the smaller the delta T you can have over the life of the emulsion, generally speaking, the longer it'll last and the, and the better storage quality you'll get out of it. And lastly, uh, the third point, um, since we need the raw ingredients to be warm and hot uh, in usage of the finished product, here's some typical usage temperatures here, tends to be well above ambient. We just logistically need to keep these things warm to hot in order to keep up with shipping demand. So it's really just a, a matter of uh, we have no other choice. It's cheaper to do it this way and, and the product usage dictates that. Uh, the point of these here is not to give you where, are, where we recommend or where we think these products need to be stored. The point of showing you this is that for a typical asphalt emulsion terminal, up here anyway, we see product usage all the way from ambient all the way up to 300 plus degrees. So we have a huge range of temperatures um, within our terminal. A really common question, if we have any producers on the line, I'm sure you get it all the time, is what temperature should I be storing a given emulsion? And as any good engineer would tell you, the answer is it depends. Um, that's always the answer, right? So 
It depends on, on the end use mostly, um, and that can change day to day and seasonally for temperature process, uh, temperature sensitive processes, something like microsurfacing might be an example. But in general, here are some guidelines. So um, your, your slower setting emulsions, so these might be things like your tack or your fog seals. Um, we typically will store them anywhere from about ambient um, up to maybe 140 or so would be pushing it. So cool, cool temperatures. For your more rapid setting products, these would be things that you would use more in like the chip seal industry. They do tend to be stored hot and used hot. So we don't like them any lower than about 170 actually, but I, I list a, a wider range here. And that brings up a pretty good point. Um, a word of practical advice really, for an asphalt emulsion terminal in a given region with a given product portfolio, usually you can find a much narrow, narrower range of temperatures that work for you and your customers. And I included an example here. This is the shell of our um, HFRS 2P tank, so high float rapid set, it's a chip seal emulsion tank. And you can see we have a label on here that says maintain 170 to 180. Um, we know that our customers in our region, that if we maintain this temperature, we just see more consistency in the field, both from our own distributor fleet, but our customers' distributor fleet as well. And it's just something then that our plant operators are trained to look for, and our tanks are labeled accordingly to, to help with that as well. So let's talk about heating a little bit, um, maintenance heat and, and, and temperature ramping. So there are really four kind of um, nominally four methods of tank heating um, available. Most terminals, I think, use some combination of these. So there really is no what is best question. It's really dependent on your region, your cost of utilities, electric versus natural gas, for example, um, and, and then demand, right? So. Um, in our plant, we bring in rail cars, and, we, and rail cars are generally outfitted with steam um, to heat to molten to get them pumpable. We also use hot oil um, for maintaining uh, molten AC for milling. Um, we use a heated glycol and water mixture to maintain asphalt emulsion temperatures, so we maintain right around about 180 degrees. Um, although we don't do this, it is relatively common for folks to use hot water for maintenance temperature on emulsions. Um, so that is an option for you. Um, some small scale applications like we saw in that kind of intro to tank slide um, also use electric heating. So this would be something like you can think of as simple as like um, a water softener element um, or not uh, a water heater element, sorry, um, an electric heat. Um, we also use electric heat for like IBC totes and heating up drums and things like that as needed um, on demand basis. I did include a picture of a cautionary tale um, at right here. So it's probably familiar to those contractor folks that have um, distributor experience. So this is a filter insert from a distributor that's outfitted with direct fire heating. So not that there's a problem with direct fire heating as a means to heat something, but it does tend to have um, extremely hot localized heating and localized heat overheating can cause emulsion to break. And that's just a word of caution. So any elements over that 185, 190-ish range can cause that, that premature breaking. And it really does tend to produce kind of a runaway effect in the tank, meaning the broken emulsion tends to uh, coagulate good emulsion and, and begin to pull it out. Um, and this is what you end up with. So the point here is not to steer you towards or away any form of heating. The point is to have you use caution, understand that these are water-based products, educate your customers that these are water-based products and, and they um, really need to be treated as such in terms of, in terms of heating. So some different options for, for heating there. So that would be tank heating, right? So these would be coils within a tank or, or what have you. Um, all of our lines and pumps at the terminal are also heated, uh, also insulated as well. Um, collectively, this kind of system would be called heat tracing, um, heat trace in the industry. For those terminal operators listening, this probably raises quite a bit of heartburn. Um, troubleshooting heat tracing is probably a top five most frustrating tasks at most terminals, but it's a very important process. We're gonna look at a few options here. Um, there is a tremendous range of variability in what can be done in terms of automation and, and so forth, but we're gonna look at kind of things that, that we do. There are basically two methods of, of tracing. There's electric and non-electric. 
non-electric could be like steam or hot oil. Non-electric are really robust. Um, you know, they, they do tend to have a high upfront cost, but in situations where you already have the infrastructure, like you have a boiler with excess capacity, um, they can be nice systems to have. They're, they don't fail easily. Um, electric systems are convenient. You know, they're easy to set up. They, uh, they offer good temperature control. They're customizable. The problem is you're, you're tied to uh, utility outages and power. So if you're in an area that gets bad thunderstorms, and uh, we have a problem with freeze thaw and moisture. You know, we're in a pretty humid and damp environment up here, um, but still we use a lot of electric trace. Um, for electric systems, you really have three types. Uh, there's what's called MI cable. MI is mineral insulated cable. Um, it's a constant wattage type of cable. It's great for high temperatures, long spans. Um, you can see from these thermostats here, it's a, it's a very customizable in terms of different temperatures for different applications process. So this is an MI cable plugging into a, uh, a hot transfer line on here on the left. On the right is an MI cable heated pump casing. Um, and this is a control panel kind of behind everything here. Um, there's a constant wattage type system, and then there's variable wattage systems. We use all MI and constant wattage. Variable wattage tends to be real popular in the chemical industry. It's good for lower temperature applications. Um, it sees limited use, I think, for most of these, these terminals. Um, here's a, a couple of other options. Let's skip to the right here. This is a this is a cable that had its or a pipe that had its insulation removed for repair, and you can see what a constant wattage cable looks like. It's just hugged up against the pipe. Um, it's it's really that simple. Um, here's the one example. I struggled to find um, examples of of uh, um, non-electric in our terminal, but here's one example of a, a hot oil trace. So um, you can see the hot oil coming in. And then this this tubing here goes inside of the insulation next to the the transfer line. So um, that's that's an option as well. As I kind of mentioned, it's been our experience that most pumping related issues in the plant are are actually heat trace issues. It can be time consuming. These are generally parallel circuits. So if if one as if one uh, line of the heat trace goes out especially for the constant wattage systems, the rest of the heat trace will still work. So it becomes a, a problem of finding that, that localized issue. Um, so it pays to set up a robust system. It pays to understand your system. I'm not here to tell you what to use, just that there are options. Um, I did fail to mention on this last slide, um, there's a reference here. You can just search via Google uh, this um, heat tracing systems. It's a free PDF. It was evidently from some sort of a short uh, course on the topic. We've got no affiliation, sponsorship, or whatever from it. I've just found it to be a nice resource to explain these different um, tracing systems. So it's there for your use if you want it. Let's revisit storage. Um, here we've listed some best practices based, again, on our experience. Um, most of our tanks, so we're going to talk a little bit about mixing here. Most of our tanks are outfitted with sidewall mixers like the one you see um, in this picture here. Here's a sidewall mixer. So on the inside of this tank, there'll be some propellers. Um, another option would be like a top mounted mixer. They tend to be very expensive, but the great advantage is they can never leak, right? I mean, this can obviously leak. Um, top mounted cannot. Um, but generally, ours are, are mostly side sidewall. Variables to consider, um, you know, there are companies and indeed you should use them that, that will help you size mixers and quantity and location. That is what they do. But generally it's tank size, fluid properties in terms of like viscosity and then like heating coil arrangement. And they're trying to design mixers that have the proper blade size, pitch and RPM to avoid dead space, but not shear the material um, really just to kind of turn it over. I think tank mixing can be a little bit overstated. I think given relatively short storage times, most products do fine with just a gentle turning over. At our terminals, we, we would only at most mix about once a day for a short period of time just to turn the tank over for QC samples. Um, most emulsions don't handle being sheared or over pumped very well. So kind of the less you can do, the better, a hands-off approach. Some things to consider though, if, if you are trying to get heat onto a product, 
Uh, mixing can help you heat your product more evenly. It helps kind of uh, make the, the temperature more homogeneous instead of um, stratified. A very similar and analogous point for QC samples, um, remove that stratification for homogeneity and, and you can get more consistent kind of QC samples. Um, a, pro, a question you do get asked a lot in this industry is with, with regard to shelf life. Um, I think this is one of those topics that's just a good feedback loop between you and your customers and then between you and your chemical supplier in order to figure out kind of what, what's best and what works best for you. I've kind of given some times here. Most of the time in the heat of the season, our rapid set products aren't even around for a day before they're shipped out, but we can get weeks to, to even months out of them. Um, you know, although emulsions can, can be designed to lengthen shelf life, a lot of times extended stability is not really a desired trait. So it's sort of that seesaw between getting them to work properly in the field, but also being able to get them to the field. Uh, so it's not a one size fits all thing. It's a feedback loop. You need to kind of design around what your needs are. Let's take just a minute and we'll talk about pumps. So you'll find several types of pumps around the terminal. So um, here's three types listed here. Generally speaking, the workhorse tends to be gear pumps. Um, that's, what you, that's what you see here. Um, they're good for higher viscosity fluids. They handle heat well. They're fairly bulletproof. They're easy to fix. Um, these type of pumps are easy to heat trace. They're commonly, you can get them jacketed, um, like a glycol or hot oil jacket. Um, some of them also have canister heaters, which are like, they look like tall, skinny, um, like uh, energy drink cans that you plug into the actual body of the, of the pump. Um, in all cases, they're preheated before we use them to about 150 degrees. That helps them get going without seizing. It helps the um, kind of wear and tear on the pump. Uh, there are other types, depending on the materials you use. Um, you know, some materials that are sheer inset or sheer sensitive, um, polymer latexes can be a good one. Progressive cavity is a good choice. We see diaphragm pumps where you're not concerned about flow rate for the sole sake of their durability. So there are other types, you really fit the pump to your needs and there are a lot of good pump suppliers out there to, to reach out to. Um, sizing is obviously dependent on demand, right? So how, how much, um, how quickly you need to, to, to move the material. Most of what we're looking at in our terminals um, would fall in that like, you know, two to 300 GPM. Here's a little wider range here, somewhere where it would take 25, maybe 40 minutes or so to load a full 5,700 gallon tanker. So we're kind of splitting efficiency and safety um, with, with the sizing of our pumps. Now, if we take a kind of a step back and we look at just the terminal layout and some options there um, with kind of equipment thought about, now we look at how it's kind of set up, sort of the forest versus the trees kind of aspect. Um, we're looking down a finished tank farm here, finished product tank farm. I've circled in different colors some noteworthy observations. Let's start with red, uh, tank labeling. So let's look at this one because it's closer here on the right-hand side. Uh, this allows operators on foot, you know, to very quickly and accurately identify and verify what's, what's in a tank and valve location. So here um, we know this is a high float um, chip seal emulsion. We know the tank number, you can say that over the radio quick. We know it's a 40,000 gallon tank in this instance, and this is FP for finished product. So it helps our operators really identify our tanks quickly. Second in green, um, these are uh, dial thermometers. You can see this one's a little bit closer. You can see it. This is actually the exact one I had a picture of earlier, just closer. Um, you know, uh, tank heating is something that can be automated. And in a lot of cases, it pays to have it be automated. But it also, those are the type of elements that fail a lot. So we also have a, the old fail safe of literally just having a dial thermometer um, to, to check. Storage temperatures um, quite is, a, is a huge quality issue. Third in yellow, uh, these are simple um, float systems. They're reliable. Um, it's for, for volume monitoring. So our plant operators know, generally speaking, for all of our tanks, how many inches, or I should say it the other way, how many gallons per inch each tank will have in it. So you can fill trucks very accurately just by monitoring where the float location is on our on our tanks. 
Um, of course, electronic options certainly work and they're available. Um, the point though is whatever option you choose, accurate and reliable, um, external methods are important for those, uh, those folks that need to be on the ground hands-on. Um, lastly, in blue, um, clear load line labeling. So this has the tank line, and if we can read close, this, this says anionic and this says cationic. So this is an anionic tank. We do have a cationic line installed for emergency, but we can clearly tell the valve location. We can clearly tell that we want anionic into an anionic tank. So again, it's, it's all about labeling, removing a lot of the uncertainty. Um, being clean, labeling cleanly is, is always going to help you um, in the long run. All plants are a little bit different, uh, but generally speaking, you know, consistency in the process is consistency in the outcome. And I think that's something that, you know, as an industry, we all kind of strive for. Um, <clears throat> if we move up now, so we were on the ground in the finished product tank farm before, we're moving up to um, our loading rack now. So let's look at a few things we have circled and, and discuss. So again, although the sun angle in this picture and the color of the labels prohibits clear reading from a picture standpoint, these are clearly labeled lines. You can read this one clearly as cationic, uh, for example. Um, clearly indicated valve positions to these lines, so we can tell which valves are open, which valves are closed. To the point uh, of trans, I guess the, the major takeaway here that I also want to bring up to this point in the terminal, you can see the tank farm behind us here. All of the lines, transfer and loading, have been isolated as either cationic or anionic. So coming out of the mill all the way to the loading rack, these are isolated lines. And in fact, the only run that's not isolated or designated, as it were, is circled here is this loading spout. So this essentially eliminate, eliminates really any compatibility issue that we could have on the terminal side. It's just something to keep in mind when you when you deal with both products types a lot like this terminal does behind us in this picture which you couldn't see would be the electrical panel to help turn on pumps um, in a hands-off way our terminal does tend to be relatively hands-on and there are definitely more automated systems but the concepts are pretty much the same two last observations in yellow i forgot a circle here too i should have had one here um, you can see these trucks wheels are chalked uh, not only that, at this terminal, the driver has shut off the truck and exited the cab. It's mandatory for loading in this terminal. Uh, you know, you've got operators standing on trucks. You've got operators that truck drivers can't see. You're moving liquid that can be um, very, very hot at several hundred gallons per minute. It's not the time to shortcut safety. Um, this is not a, a talk about safety, but I think it's all of our duty to um, help enforce that. And, of course, our fire extinguisher here as well. So this is a view from the loading rack on, on uh, at least one of the racks at the, uh, at the terminal. Good, so um, we've kind of got from the mill um, to the loading rack, and now it's time to actually load. So I thought the best way to do this one would just be some bullet points, some do's and don'ts, and then we can kind of go into some of them in more detail um, in, in the forthcoming slides. Um, how about the do's? We've already talked about safety. Um, again, not a safety talk, but we have to stress it. Follow your company's PE guideline, uh, PPE guidelines. Um, this second bullet point is so critical to check and recheck the, ve the vessel for empty and residual material. Um, what our operators have been trained to do is, is they have to look into the trailer. Um, you can see the um, um, splash guard here. A splash plate here in this trailer, we can visually verify that this trailer is as empty as it's going to get. Um, what can be equally as important, but usually cannot be verified, is what was last in the trailer. And we'll talk about that next, um, but it's, it's an important um, thing to consider as a do. Uh, dilution. So we have a full slide on dilution coming up, but a couple of do's when loading. Um, we want to do it slowly. If it's going to be done into a truck, we want to use water at a similar temperature as the emulsion. And hopefully we've tested this emulsion with this water in the lab previously to know we're okay with it. Note that um, you know, not all emulsions, even of the same type, are created equal. And we'll talk about that in the dilution slide, but it pays to pay attention here. Um, 
Cationic emulsifiers do tend to be foam positive, foam stabilizing. So just be aware, cationic products do tend to foam. So that's something to keep an eye on, uh, depending on the trailer size, depending on how quickly you load the tanks. How about um, some do nots? So mostly these do nots come to um, safety and compatibility. So partially filled trailers, water-based products with hot products, um, this last point shouldn't be overlooked. Encourage the operators to not be cautious of black flagging a trailer, meaning um, really raising a, a concern. Hey, I can't load this trailer. We don't have enough information. It breeds good safety culture. It tells everybody you care about them, um, but it's good for the terminal and good for our industry as well. So don't abandon your post and, and it pays to um, have proper training on this. Very busy slide, but it's an example slide, and I think it's a, a crucial slide for the loading aspect. So what we're looking at here is kind of a training document for our terminal operators, but it's product to be loaded at the top. So this is what's going in right now. And then on the left, it's product that was in the tank. So this is a training tool. And what it does is it says, green is no immediate concern. Follow your normal operating procedure to get this trailer loaded. Yellow and red means take a little bit more caution and in some instances stop. And we can see the absolute number one here. The trailer must be empty. We consider empty less than about a half percent capacity. You can define it however you'd like, but the trailer must be empty. Any residual can cause off spec, it can cause broken emulsion, and it can really be a safety, safety issue as well. Just because two emulsions, let's just say we're dealing with just emulsions, are cationic, does not mean that they can be mixed, even if they're the same ASHTO designation. So that pays to do some lab work. It pays to understand. Again, with empty trailers, it might not be an issue, but it's something to keep in mind. So let's say that we have a trailer that's empty. We verified it empty, and we can look at a couple of examples. Let's say we want to load hot AC. What do we know about hot oil? It doesn't mix with water, right? So um, hot products and water don't mix. It doesn't take much for a boil over to occur. It happens to us often, it shouldn't, but it does. Fuel can be a tough one. Um, trailers that had contained fuel, not a lot of fuel. Uh, let me rephrase this. It doesn't take a lot of fuel oil to throw asphalt, paving grade asphalt off spec. Emulsions can handle it a little bit better, but you do need to be aware of, of spec drift in, in, that, um, in that regard. Overall, if we just took a step back and just kind of squinted at this chart though, what we'd see is the majority of it is yellow or red. This is not intended as like one engineer's way to slow a process down and make it inefficient. It's really uh, so that this process is not taken for granted, right? Safety is paramount. And again, consistency in is consistency out. If you do things the same way uh, and you do it the right way, you should really minimize the amount of problems. Um, this, is a, this is a really good tool to use for those um, terminals that have a really wide portfolio of products. They use a lot of different common carriers or there's a lot of contractors coming in because you, you really do need to take that time to, to verify. Um, Promised a slide about diluting and mixing. So an almost kind of ubiquitous uh, product at emulsion terminals is tack and fog seal type products. Both of these products are commonly diluted with water, either to lower residue or make the product more sprayable, whatever. Um, a lot of emphasis though recently has been placed on quality of tack code in our industry. And some of that burden I do think falls back to us to understand our product, educate our customers on our product. So um, there does seem to be kind of an ever-changing spec in our industry with TAC. Our state, Wisconsin, like many, has moved to a minimum residue spec, but we still hear of a lot of contractors coming in asking just for a straight dilution. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, it pays to kind of be aware of, of what the spec is to really help, help educate the customers. Second, the process of dilution as a whole. Um, you need to be testing this. Um, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be taken for granted that you can just add water and it'll always be okay. Check compatibility, usually not a problem, but it doesn't hurt to have that checkpoint. Um, avoid over pumping again here. Um, and just note that not all grades are, are great for diluting. Um, there are grades that take it better than others. 
Using the product relatively quickly is generally advised. Um, you are diluting the chemistry and you run the risk of a little bit quicker settlement in the storage tank um, in that, in that uh, regard. So a couple of bullet points here, just sort of some best practices, tips that, that we've learned. The actual hauling aspect is relatively straightforward. Um, some of our experiences though, I think could be useful for you. So most modern trailers are pretty safe and reliable. Um, in general, since we're hauling a liquid, um, you know, um, baffles for safety are, are pretty important and sloshing and so forth. Uh, believe it or not, really our trailers are not heated. They all are insulated. Um, our uh, trucking uh, director does like to spec new trailers with air suspension for the aid of draining. You can see here, you can, un, um, you can drop the air on the butt end of the trailer um, and create some sort of a gradient um, for unloading. Um, I know many terminals will also build a small elevation change at unloading racks, um, you know, a little hump in the ground or something to end in draining the liquid. It really just de depends on what your business model is, if you're owning the trailer or whatever, if you have that choice. Um, as I mentioned, most trailers are insulated. Um, up here, you know, it gets cold in August, uh, so it's a must. Um, heating is, is definitely application specific, right? I mean, if chip seal emulsions need to stay hot, that's a little bit different than like a tap coat emulsion. Um, we really haven't seen an issue with product cooling down for the need of heat. We see about a 10 degree drop in the summertime over a 24 hour period, maybe 18 to 20 degrees uh, in the real cold, cold weather. Um, we, we've loaded trailers. We'll oftentimes have second or third shift load trailers for the next day. And some of these trailers might sit 36 hours up, up to about 48. And really, we haven't had a problem. If we do, we, we just get the product off of it and try again. So um, a big, big uh, question we get asked a lot, uh, um, having our own kind of trucking fleet, is should trailers be designated cationic or anion? So I actually asked um, trucking managers at two of our companies uh, two different locations, both deal with both anionic and cationic, and uh, wouldn't you know it, I got two different answers. So company one, this is a company that does a lot of cationic and anionic, both a good healthy split. Um, he does not designate, never had an issue. He says if the trailer's been emptied properly, you do not have an issue. Uh, believe it or not, he actually believed that there was an advantage of switching back and forth as a way to kind of neutralize. I don't know if that's true, but he, he thought it was. Company two is just the opposite. They said, I designate trailers, cationic or anionic. They never, they never swap them. It works for their business model. So again, two ways to do the same thing, haul both types of products. Both have very clear history of working. I think the point is um, to know the business model, proper training um, and proper SOPs. Um, I wanted to include a close up of this, but I didn't get to it. Most of these trailers will also store a, like an eight to 12 foot hose. That would be something, oh, here, you can see it off the back here for loading, unloading. I just want to mention, be cautious of these hoses. A lot of times when contamination happens, it can be from material left in these hoses. Operators clean with fuel, warm fuel a lot of times, residual fuel, as anyone that's taken samples from a distributor knows is, is a huge problem. Um, you leave it in the spray bar, you leave it in the hoses. It can, it can really create a problem for you. Drain them often, replace often. They're cheap relative to fines and non-compliant material. So relevant to this time of year, um, got some winterization chores and tips for buttoning up the equipment. Um, on the plant side of things, you know, water freezes. So we gotta get water out of the plant. Uh, emulsion, emulsion waste is boiled out. We'll talk about that next. Uh, we'll keep, get water out of the lines. It's really not your friends, like water's not your friend, like most civil infrastructure. Um, asphalt itself will overwinter pretty well, it's just allowed to cool. Some chemicals can, some cannot. So get with your, comp uh, get with your chemical company um, and learn about that. This is also a good time to think about next season, uh, which tanks are gonna hold what, what kind of turnover are we gonna see? Sometimes very little is needed, uh, but if there is extensive tank cleaning, um, some companies will help with that. Waste management is one. They can come in and neutralize tanks. Um, again, talk to your suppliers, generate a plan, um, and, and, and execute. On the trucking side, I, I went back to the well for answers. Uh, I asked the same two managers, how do you deal with haul trailers? How do you get them ready for the winter? Um, first manager said what they do is 
they'll generally add hot AC to flash off any liquid that might be in there. They'll drive the trailer around, stop it hard, you know, slosh the liquid, another 100 gallons, pump it off, open them up, let it drain. Company two just chooses to do something a little easier. They just get a good drain on the trailer and leave it open. And um, they let it go that way all winter. Good vehicle inspection, swapping of lines and cleaning, I think goes a long way in this. So um, this picture here, I just want to mention one other thing about cleaning. You know, the outside of, of trailers and distributors and things, um, we use a combination of like a delimonene cleaner. So like a liquid orange citrus cleaner. They make gelled stuff that works well for like vertical things and liquid stuff for getting into crevices. Um, we've been messing around with the dry ice um, pressure washer. That seems to work pretty good too. So there are a lot of options you can, you can kind of ask around. This is a picture, not right or wrong. I just thought it was cool and we could all use a cool picture right now. So um, this is the inside of a tank after it's been drained and you're looking at heating coils here on the top and bottom. And these are asphalt sickles kind of hanging off of the coil. So I just thought it was kind of cool. Nothing, nothing new there. Um, no webinar on asphalt emulsion would be complete without an uh-oh slide, so we've got an uh-oh slide. So cue, uh, a few problems that we commonly see on a yearly basis and some tips and tricks um, that we've seen. Number one on the list, my material won't pump. Uh, first place that we look is heat trace. Um, a lot of times it's a, a part of the line is down. Um, be cautious of slugs if you do get it to heat back up. So slugs would be like the plug that's causing it not to pump. You know, these can come barreling through, they can splash, they can uh, cause a lot of pressure issues. So just be careful with that. Okay, my material is broken in the tank. Well, first of all, I would say verify that it's, if it's solid, you know, goopy, or if it's just beginning to settle. If it is just starting to um, settle down, a little bit of gentle heat might buy you enough time to use it, uh, mix it up, use it right away. If the material actually has gone bad, Sometimes we'll get the question, well, can't I just add some more emulsifier and mix it up? Generally, no. Um, this can also be really counterproductive, uh, not, not an option. Um, some terminals will remill off, uh, uh, re -mill this material. Um, we don't do that, but I know some do. Um, really, testing is, is critical. You may not need more emulsifier in that instance. Monitor residue and pH, use it quickly, and, and you can get by with something like that if the material's pumpable. Um, a good option is just changing the grade. So if, a, like, let's say an RS begins to go bad, adding some fuel and emulsifier, um, maybe you can even get it into an MS territory and, and find a use for that. So um, there are some times that you can, you can save it that way. When all else fails, um, most plants have what's colloquially kind of called a slop tank. Um, this material still has a lot of value, needs to be used cautiously. Um, we're going to go over, um, uh, I guess we're not, but um, use the material cautiously. Uh, these tanks are boiled out at the end of the year um, carefully. That material, in our terminal at least, is used um, as it can be in cutback applications. Sometimes it can be reused in emulsion applications. Uh, very rarely can you ever get by in the PG world with that. But um, really, testing is critical. Understanding that it changes load to load is critical for those type of tanks. So there's not a one size fits all option, unfortunately, but um, some things to kind of think about here. So again, um, you know, this slide deck uh, will be distributed. Um, in PDF form, at least, to the, the attendees here. I believe Allie's recording it, and, and it'll be posted on the EMA um, website. Um, if you have specific questions, by all means, um, my contact information is listed here. I can help any way I can. I can ask some facilities engineers and things if you have set up questions. Um, general questions, we're happy to take. Otherwise, uh, we really thank you for your time this afternoon, um, and we'll open it up. I'll hand it back to Aaron to kind of moderate if there is anything, but um, thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Dan. That, uh, that was a great overview of uh, some of the considerations for handling and hauling of asphalt emulsion. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm a firm believer that a picture is worth a thousand words, so thanks for all the great uh, plan shots. That was awesome. Um, and, and just a quick note, as Dan had mentioned, this is this is being recorded. So for anyone who has signed up for this webinar, uh, you will get an email with a link to the recording. So uh, if you want to watch it after the fact or share it with anyone, 
uh, you can do it at that point. But um, yeah, as Dan said, if there are any questions, you can just use the chat feature, um, or excuse me, the, the questions feature in the pane on the right of your screen, just to send any questions. And uh, um, and Dan will do uh, do his best here to, to hopefully help you out. Okay, we have one, oh, let me just. This is right, being so recorded, so there's a bad time to make a fool of me. We have uh, on emulsion tanks, is the side mixer pointing downwards or upwards? Um, it's not pointed downwards or upwards. It's generally level, but it's not perpendicular to the wall of the tank, which means it's it's at an angle. Um, so if you were to like peel the top off the tank and, and the emulsion was clear and you could see down into the mixers, they're actually kind of at an angle relative to the sidewall. Um, that's something that's designed by these, these um, mixer companies. And a lot of these companies do a really great job of that. They can do simulations and things. But um, the ones that I've seen designed are not up or down. They're actually level, but they're not perpendicular to the sidewall. Of course, there's a pitch, you know, to the blades, though. So I guess you could argue that there is some up and down movement that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much my experience as well. All right. Our next question: uh, How often do you sample and test stored emulsions? Um, it depends on what the emulsion is being used for. Uh, if it needs to be DOT compliant, so our DOT is a member of what's called the Combined State Binder Groups. I suspect other contractors and age, or producers in here might be members of other groups like Northeast User Producer Group and so forth. Um, so ours have a specified frequency. We used to test um, each tank each day. Uh, that was a little bit too much. Now it's at least each tank each week and every new load, um, every new batch produced. So we have a batching plant here. We don't have a continuous flow plant. So that's how often we test. But you really need to um, test according to your agency requirements. Okay, the next question is uh, quality concerns for long hauls for rapid setting material, four hours plus away in a one direction haul. Any any concerns for that or, uh, or guidance? No concerns. Um, we routinely haul from our plants to northern Minnesota, which can be a um, several hundred mile haul, which is on the order of magnitude that um, that question is describing. Um, we've not had any issues with temperature drop. Again, you're looking at maybe in, in chip sealing season, only about a 10 degree drop in a one day period. So assuming you can, based on DOT laws, can get there with the driver in a reasonable amount of time, we've not had any issue. Now, as some rapid set emulsions begin to cool, CRS2P is a, a good one. They can they can start to gel a little bit, so you should be aware of whatever that temperature is and and plan accordingly the temperature that it needs to leave the plant at. But there would be no special handling on our end. We just fill the trailer, find a driver that can pack a lunch, and go. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, and then the last one that we have as of this moment is uh, what is the recommended mixer settings on storage tanks? So for example, RPM speed, type of mixer, when to mix, et cetera. Yeah, that would be a, a really tank size specific. Um, I don't know if I can even tell you what the RPMs would be. It depends, I suppose, on if you're trying to heat it, you're just trying to turn it over. If whoever sent that question wants to provide emails them like direct detail on like size of the tank or what you're trying to do, I, I'll be happy to forward that along to some facilities engineers. But yeah, I apologize. I don't I don't know in depth exactly what a good answer for that would be. But please do reach out if it's something you're concerned about. Okay. All right, and we just got another one here. Um, how long can a rapid setting emulsion sit on a trailer at a job site before being used? Um, I mean, I wouldn't let it sit for for more than a day. I mean, uh, again, it's if the trailer's not heated and most trailers can't mix, you know, you are up against, it's basically just sitting there. So, um, I would try and stick to using it within that 24 hour or so window or getting it or recommending like a 
a um, portable storage tank or something that can get this product mixed again for homogeneity consistency that kind of thing um, again rapid sets can be a little bit finicky that way um, you know there's they're kind of critical to keep them above a certain temperature yeah absolutely all right um, so does anybody have any further questions we have uh, a couple more minutes here before we can close it out um, we'll just wait see here Otherwise, I think we're, we're at the end of it, Dan. I think we've answered everything. So, um, yeah, so with that being said, um, you know, just to kind of echo Dan's comments, thank you all for, for being able to attend the session. This is great. Um, and, uh, and if you have any further questions on any of the material herein, um, you know, Dan's email address is right here. If you have any questions, I'm sure he'd be glad to answer them. So uh, thank you, Dan, very much for putting this together. This was a fantastic uh, webinar. It's been great. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Yeah, thanks again.